Lost is a complex show with lots of mysteries and lingering ambiguities. Many viewers expected the series finale to bring all of these unknowns into full clarity. Like watching a movie with a game-changing twist at the end in which the twist explains and recontextualizes the whole story that came before. But Lost is not a two-hour movie, with several main mysteries that can be explained in one revelatory twist at the end like, say, The Sixth Sense. This was 121 episodes of television, each episode clocking in at approximately 40 minutes. Told across six years. Aired on network television in a serialized format. In which the writers had to battle deadlines, fan reactions, budget limitations, production problems, talent conflicts, contract disputes, and time constraints. It could never be a perfect story without any problems or mistakes. The writers will admit as much. Like any long-running series, it has imperfections. But showrunners Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse retained authorship throughout. Their voices, as the primary authors, is pervasive. Even though there are various examples of retconning the mythology and continuity errors, there is meaning and purpose behind the majority of the narrative. There is specific intention, so, it takes a lot more discussion and analysis to explain something this big and complex due to its format and evolution over time. It can't all be summed up in one video like, The Sixth Sense Ending Explained. One video is not enough as there are simply too many elements, ideas and themes in the show to do it that way. This channel is living proof of that. The question that stands before you right now is. Were they dead the whole time? The short answer, is a resounding no. They were not dead the whole time. This is not only a misconception but a pervasive criticism that the show is repeatedly hit with. However, it is important to understand how such a misconception became so widespread in popular culture and why this myth continues to be perpetuated by some fans, new viewers, and clickbait articles. The initial wave of people who thought that the ending of Lost indicated that the characters had been dead the whole time came from two camps after the finale aired. The first group were fans who were genuinely confused by the last scenes of the show, and could not fully reconcile the flash sideways with the living world timeline. Some of these viewers simply concluded that because everyone was dead in the church, and the sideways appeared to be an extension of their lives on the island, then they must have been dead all along. This misconception was compounded by the fact that the final credit roll occurs over footage of the original beach site with the oceanic wreckage, in which there are no characters present. The beach is desolate and calm, as if no one had ever been there in the first place. This footage was intended to be a way for the audience to decompress after the incredibly emotional finale. It was a stylistic choice. However, instead, this well-meaning attempt to play out the series with some meditative B-roll production footage actually misled some already confused viewers into thinking this was some kind of final clue to the audience that our losties had been dead this whole time. There have been multiple instances of the showrunners correcting this for the record. They confirm that the footage at the end of the finale was intended to be a stylistic choice, not a clue or a hint to something else. Q said they thought it would be good to have a buffer between the end of the show and before the commercials start. They didn't have a lot of extra footage lying around, but they did have footage of the plane wreckage on the beach, which was shot before the wreckage needed to be moved. The creative team thought that if they put those shots at the end of the show, it will allow for a buffer. A moment to reflect on what has just happened. But when people saw the footage of the plane with no survivors, it exacerbated the problem. If you never went back to re-watch the series, or even just the finale, this idea would never again be properly challenged. Unless you went to Reddit or YouTube, or a place where lost discussions still took place. It's an honest mistake to make. Not everyone is a hardcore fan of the show, and not every fan re-watches the show over and over again. Some viewers are more casual. They enjoyed the episodes week to week but never delved into the mythology. Or went into deep dives on the story. These viewers saw the finale scenes in the church and took them as the big, revelatory twist ending that many had hoped to see in the final minutes of the series. An answer that pulled the rug out from everything that came before. Just like The Sixth Sense. It became a catch-all explanation. However, if we look at the end credits footage with this idea in mind, that everyone was dead, it hardly makes sense. The plane wreckage is there, but there are no bodies. No signs of carnage. No signs of fatalities. If the characters had died upon impact then there would be bodies everywhere. There is a second group of series finale watchers who also came away with this misconception about the characters being dead from the start. And these are the viewers that lost interest in the show between season 2 and 3, and gave up watching it full time. 
perhaps they sense that the series has started to spin its wheels. You might know people like this. Maybe you are one of those who gave up on the show. Some of these departing viewers returned for the series finale, under the mistaken assumption that it would be an information download explaining everything through exposition, or reveal that aforementioned, grand plan twist. This, of course, did not happen. Instead, viewers who had not been following the show closely over the last few seasons found themselves walking into an ending without full context. To the uninitiated, the final scenes appeared to show that the characters had been dead in a purgatory state all along. Just as many cynics had suspected from the first episode, it was a validation that bailing on the show in season two or three was the right call. And this misunderstanding fed into an emerging counter-narrative that, not only was everyone dead, but the finale was bad because of this. It was seen as a cop-out, and that it never explained anything properly. It was like a shared fantasy. I mean, it didn't seem like there was like, I mean, what? No. These misconceptions and finale myths have become sadly prevalent over the years. The purgatory theory completely undermines the point of the entire series and the importance of what the island represented and why the characters needed it in order to better themselves as people. My video series has gone to great lengths to explain all the mysteries in the show on their own terms. The theory that everyone died in the plane crash and that the island was a place in purgatory is, quite frankly, a lazy way to explain all the strange events that happened throughout the series. This theory means one does not have to analyze the show in any greater detail or depth. You need not untangle the plot threads nor study the machinations of the narrative any further. Because they are all dead. End of story. Nothing more to think about. As the years have worn on, this myth has been debunked, not just by fans, but by the showrunners themselves. They have given many interviews explaining how the characters were not dead from the beginning of the show. Here is one of the more definitive ones given by Damon Lindelof in an interview with On The Verge. So at the end of the show, um, the last frame of the show, Matthew Fox closes his eyes, closes his eye and dies. Yeah. That happened. Like, in our context of happening. Like, that happened. That's all and real. So, and so then, from the moment that he closed his eye, um, all that other stuff that we did in the, in the sixth season of the show, the flash sideways, where nobody knows each other, and the plane never crashed, that is whatever your interpretation is, I'm not gonna talk about what our intention is, but that's what you would define as not having happened oh. or happening, but everything that we ever showed you, anything that takes place on the island in Lost happened, you know, absolutely 100%. The plane crashed, those people survived, everything that you saw throughout those six seasons, like some like the whole struggle between good and bad, that's like a really meaningful thing that actually occurred. Yes. That would have threatened the universe had yes. it not been. The Dharma Initiative is real, the island is real, all those Hurley right now, her, right now at this moment in time, Hurley and Ben, uh, and with, help some, with, with some help from Walt, are actually running things on the island. Um, maintaining it. While certain mysteries and ambiguities in Lost invite interpretation, as demonstrated on this very channel, there are many elements of the narrative that are not open to speculation in this same way. There are definitive explanations behind certain mysteries. Contemporary audiences have perhaps become overly accustomed to thinking that every work of fiction is totally open to be read any way they see fit. It is true that some stories are designed to be this way in which, what an audience brings to the story is just as important as what the creator intended. David Lynch films operate within this enigmatic space, and encourage viewers to project their own imaginations onto the material. You fill in the blanks and draw your own conclusions. Even Damon Lindelof's follow-up show, The Leftovers, falls into this category. The show is a psychological exploration of death, grief and spirituality. But, ultimately, the meaning of the show and its mysteries are what you make of it. Other stories can be incredibly closed-ended. In other words, they are self-evident in what they are about, and what they mean. Certain genres generally tend to fall into this category. Action and comedy genres in particular. What you see is quite often what you get. But then there are stories that do have very specific and intended meanings. And they might not always be obvious to every viewer. The point of such a story lies within the meaning and the subtext. So-called elevated horror films exist within this space. Films like The Babadook might appear to be about a Freddy Krueger monster but are really about mental health and depression. 
you can watch The Babadook as a straight-up horror film, but to fully appreciate what it is saying and exploring, you need to understand the subtext and the author's intention. Lost exists somewhere between all three of these types of narrative. The surface action adventure storytelling that gives us thrills and twists. The enigmatic, interpretative qualities of more thoughtful, metaphorical and ambiguous narratives that encourage speculation and discourse. You don't have a son, Jack. And the stories that have such specific meaning that you need to unlock the subtext in order to understand the story as intended. In Lost, the author's intention is crucial if we want to understand what the narrative is trying to convey to us about the nature of the flash sideways. More specifically, what those final scenes in the church actually mean, and how they fit into the overall architecture of the series. The concept of the flash sideways is based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead's concept of the Bardo, which is the state of existence intermediate between two lives on Earth. According to Tibetan tradition, after death and before one's next birth, when your consciousness is not connected with a physical body, you experience a variety of phenomena. For certain souls, the bardo offers a state of great opportunity for liberation. While, for others, it can become a place of danger as karmically created hallucinations impede or prevent one from achieving transcendence and rebirth. Part of the confusion comes from the way Season 6 is set up. Season 5 ends on the idea that detonating Jughead could potentially change the past and alter the futures of our losties. That they would never crash on the island and, instead, land safely at LAX. But the show eventually confirms that whatever happened, happened. Because the sideways turns out to be something else altogether. Nothing was changed nor prevented by our losties' actions during the incident of 1977. Which means the detonation of Jughead always happened. The ringing in Kate's ears is a result of that detonation. We will explore Jughead and the events surrounding the incident in more detail in another FAQ. The point of mentioning it here is that Jughead was simply a plot device. It was a red herring to take us into season 6. The writers wanted us to speculate and believe that changing the timeline was absolutely made possible. Because they wanted to Trojan horse in the flash sideways. Without the time travel narrative preceding this, it would have become all too obvious that the flash sideways was some kind of purgatory. The writers needed to disguise this concept under the guise of an alternative timeline. And Jughead was the smoking gun they used to mask their true intentions. This led viewers down the garden path to believe what we were seeing play out in season 6 was an alternative 2004, rather than the afterlife. In an interview with Collider, Damon Lindelof explains. But the idea of the Bardo is, is like, it's a place that you go when you die, but you don't know that you're dead. And the entire purpose of being in this space is to come to the revelation that you have died. And so we were like, oh God, that would be a really cool way, thing to do in the final season. But people will know what we're up to unless we make them think it's something else. Is there so, can, can we disguise it as like, a, as a time travel paradox? And so that, that basically, led to us backing into season five so that the incident would end season five. And so when you started to get presented with, you know, Oceanic 815 flying over a sunken island, your brain would tell you, oh, this is a parallel timeline. There are many clues throughout season six that indicate the sideways is taking place in the afterlife. No! No! I want you to know, Jack, you died for nothing. In the sideways, the blood that keeps reappearing on Jack's neck is a subconscious reminder of where the man in black began to cut his throat. She wanted to tell me. That's what she wanted to tell you. It worked. <sighs> what worked? Oops. <laughs> I worked.
worked. It worked. Uh. Whoa. Did you feel that? We could get coffee sometime. I gotta get you out of here. We can go touch. We should get coffee sometime. I'd love to, but the machine ate my daughter. I only got one left. We can go touch. Miles picked up on Juliet's last thought as her consciousness drifted into the sideways. It worked. Has nothing to do with changing the past. It is a moment in which a dying body's consciousness connects the living world to the sideways world. It is the same thing that later happens to Desmond. When Desmond gets blasted by the electromagnetic energy, his consciousness moves into the sideways for a few moments. Initially, we assume he has somehow entered the parallel dimension in which Oceanic 815 never crashed. However, in reality, Desmond's consciousness has glimpsed beyond death for a brief moment to experience the afterlife. It has gone beyond space and time. What Desmond experiences in the episode Happily Ever After is a near-death experience. Also known as an NDE. He's okay. Indeed he is. How long was I unconscious for? Well, no more than a few seconds. Other clues along the way included the visual concept of reflections. Characters looking into mirrors. The reflections are a reminder of the true selves. The mirrors provide a window back into the living world. All souls must pass through the sideways, aka the bardo. It's not an exclusive place for the Oceanic 815 survivors. There are many characters not in the church at the end, such as Benjamin Linus, Alexandra and Daniel Russo, Anna Lucia Cortez, Daniel Faraday and Miles Strom, Charles Widmore, and Eloise Hawking, plus, many others. These characters are not ready to move on yet, but will move on eventually with other people from their lives who meant the most to them. Their own soulmates. Everyone ultimately goes through the sideways subjectively. Our main characters experience this dreamlike construct as an alternate 2004 because that year had great significance to them as a group. It is the year that they all came together as soulmates in the living world. And they all experience the sideways simultaneously, even if their actual deaths were many decades apart. But for someone like Richard Alpert, he is nowhere to be seen. Most likely because he is experiencing the sideways as an alternate 1867 in which he and Isabella are together. Where she never died of pneumonia. Where they can live in a reconstruction of their lives together, without conflict, until they are ready to move on. It's different for everyone. It all depends on what time you died in and who was most important to you. The sideways is a gateway to the afterlife. All souls pass through it in order to reach the next phase of their existence. The one unifying factor of this reality is that it shows people what their lives would have been like had the island, and Jacob, not intervened in their destiny. The island is sunk in the sideways to demonstrate this idea. If we look carefully at the state of the island, everything that was on it in the living world is still there. The Dharma barracks. The remnants of the Tawaret statue with four toes. Everything just as it was up to at least 1977. Which means the island history technically, quote-unquote, happened, in the sideways. It's just a slightly alternative history because our Oceanic 815 characters never interacted with the history of events on the island. More specifically, they never went back in time to create the causality wave. So, in the sideways version of history, young Ben was never shot by Saeed. The incident was never prevented from happening because there was no Juliet or Jughead to stop it. Which means Roger and Ben would have been evacuated along with everyone else in this alternative 1977 and got off the island. This is why both Ben and Roger remember the island already in the sideways and speak about their time on it. That's why I signed up for that damn Dharma initiative and took you to the island and... They were decent people. Smarter than I'll ever be. Imagine how different our lives would have been. If we'd stayed. The island sunk as a result of our losties not being there to stop the incident. Of course, had this happened in the real world 1977, then the world would have ended. However, because the sideways is essentially a dream construct, it doesn't end the world. 
because everyone is already dead. While Ben and Roger remember an alternate history of their experiences on the island, they still have yet to remember what really happened. The sideways has prevented them from remembering the true lives, in which Roger became an abusive father and Ben murdered him years later. Instead, they experience their lives had the island not entangled them in its tapestry of time. And they get to experience a close father-son relationship as a result of that island absence. Every character in the sideways has a grounding in their actual real-world history. The island had major influence on various aspects of their lives and decisions that fed into the tapestry of time. In life, their destinies could not be picked apart from that tapestry. But, in death, their destinies can diverge from what actually happened to them. So we can see what could have been. And we see that these people were soulmates who would have crossed paths and affected one another's lives regardless. They were connected in both life and death. Thanks, Doc. Yeah. No problem. The island only needs to exist in the living world. We are through the looking glass now. On the other side. Hence, the sideways. Now, let's listen very carefully to what Christian Shepherd tells his son Jack at the church in series finale episode, The End. Yeah, I'm real. You're real. Everything that's ever happened to you is real. All those people in the church, they're all real too. And they're all... And they're all dead? Everyone dies sometime, kiddo. Some of them before you, some long after you. This is a very clear series of statements. Everything that happened in the show, both on and off the island, was real. The lives of our characters before the crash really happened. And all of the events that happened on the island after the crash really happened too. If they had all died in the crash, Christian would have no need to specify that some of the people in the church died long after Jack did. Because, according to the logic of this dead the whole time theory, everyone on Oceanic 815 would have been killed on impact. No one from that flight would have died long after Jack. The point of the sideways is that it's the place where our main characters come to remember their lives on the island together. They need to do this before moving on to the next phase of their existence. The church is the place that this group created so that they could find each other and transcend. It's their little corner of this collective dream space within the source. The island as purgatory is nothing more than a myth. Sometimes new viewers might fall into the same trap and mistakenly believe that in order for all of the characters on the show to have arrived in the afterlife simultaneously, they must have died at the same time. Hence, everyone dying in the plane crash. However, such a notion doesn't hold up under close scrutiny. Well, there is no now. Here. Remember, time only exists in the living world. The sideways exists within a fourth dimension beyond our linear, three-dimensional perceptions of reality. This purgatory myth also fails to explain the existence of other characters who weren't on the plane. Like Juliet Burke and Benjamin Linus. And Richard Alpert, who isn't even from the same era as the Oceanic survivors. These characters didn't get introduced to the Oceanic characters until after the crash. So, why is Juliet stuck on this island purgatory? Why is Ben? And what of Jacob and the man in black? Their whole story in Across the Sea doesn't make any sense if the island is purgatory and a place where only dead people go. They hadn't even been born until they were on the island. In fact, why did any of our main characters go through purgatory on the island only to then die again and wake up in another purgatory? It makes no narrative sense. Once you start pulling on the threads of this theory, it all unravels in spectacular fashion. If they were dead the whole time then there would have been no need for the flash sideways as a concept at all. Because surely that is what the island was supposed to be within the logic of this theory. This idea of everyone always being dead from the start negates the entire purpose of the Flash Sideways in Season 6. Perhaps this might have had some validity if the story had stayed on the island for the whole of the series. And if we only ever saw the outside world in the flashbacks. 
but the show makes a point to take us back to the real world for large chunks of both season 4 and season 5 with the Oceanic 6 plotline. This theory undermines everything our characters lived through. Everything they struggled with and fought over. And, ultimately, everything they died for whilst living on the island. We can look back on the sideways and accept it as fantasy. As a great what-if scenario. And this enriches the character arcs and themes of the narrative overall. But to look back on all six seasons as being set in literal purgatory does nothing but erase the drama, the stakes and the various meanings behind the character stories and mythology. It erases the point of the show. So, why is it so problematic that people subscribe to this myth of characters being dead the whole time? Why does it matter? Can't people just believe what they want about a fictional TV series? Well, of course. Everyone can believe what they want. This discourse has never really been about denying people their own creative license to interpret a story in a way that makes sense to them. This is about objective truth and established facts. Two things that have come under constant fire over the past decade. The argument around this divisive reading of Lost is incredibly reflective of the way people interact in the real world of today. Objective truths have suddenly become interpretive. Established facts are being challenged and subverted. And when it comes to understanding the meaning behind a real-world event, or a work of fiction, people are choosing to immerse themselves in their own realities and explanations. Even if they contradict what is really going on, or what information is objectively factual. People who honestly believe that characters were dead the whole time on Lost are not bad people, nor are they deserving of ridicule, but they do perpetuate a myth about a story that they either did not fully understand, or simply, did not care, to fully understand. Instead of listening to evidence, logic and reason, they retreated into their own subjective interpretations. Even though they are not supported by the established facts. It is important, now more than ever, to be able to understand the difference between the truth of the world around us, and the truths we choose to believe. As well as the difference between the stories being told to us, and the stories we tell, ourselves. There is a big difference. Lost has many themes and ideas at its core. It wants us to talk about big metaphysical concepts and small precious emotions. It wants us to feel, but it also wants us to think. There are definitive meanings and readings to a text, whether we always understand the text or not. Whether we like the meanings, or not. In the case of Lost, they were dead the whole time, is definitively and objectively wrong. If you just superimpose your own reading onto a text rather than try to understand what it is trying to say, then you miss out on its intended meaning. Its intended truth. A truth that helps to unlock all the other mysteries and ambiguities. There is such a thing as objective meaning and objective truth in fiction. Lost isn't a Rorschach test in which any interpretation is valid. It is a puzzle to be sold. It is assembled from specific pieces that must be put together in order to create the complete picture. That picture is not about dead people in purgatory experiencing weird events until they realize they are dead. It's about people who were lost in their lives who find each other, and ultimately, a second chance to find love, redemption and purpose. But all of this takes place in the living realm. It's like Jack eventually comes to realize. All of this matters. I would like to draw a line under this subject with another direct quote from co-creator and showrunner, Damon Lindelof. While I always believe in trusting the tale and not the teller, in the case of this particular frequently asked question, nothing can be more definitive than the teller himself, telling us all, in clear and simple terms. In the final scene uh, of the show uh, that precedes the church where basically Jack's father, Christian Shepherd says some things to Jack, one of the things that Jack says is like, wait a minute, hold on, is this, is this real? Like, did any of this happen? His father says, it's all real, it all happened, everything happened, um, you know, and so I was like, that's gonna make it pretty clear. Well, if it wasn't clear before, I hope it is now. Thank you for watching. Please like, share and subscribe to keep this channel alive. Until the next time, stay lost.